one of the most important things that determines the performance of your your kernel um, is the way that you access memory. Okay, uh, so that might be global memory, local memory. Uh, each memory is a little bit different. We're going to be looking at global memory. So global memory has the it has the highest uh, latency. So it, it usually takes the the longest to access unless we're doing something catastrophically bad. Um, so yeah, optimizing your global memory accesses is usually the first the first thing that you can do to optimize your application, uh, especially if you're in if you're in a memory bound space, um, and a yeah, uh, uh, especially a bandwidth bound space. So in this section, we're going to learn about coalesced global memory access. We're going to learn about how it impacts your performance. We're going to learn about row major versus column major um, and struct of arrays versus array of structs. Okay, so as I said, uh, reading to, reading from and writing to global memory is very expensive. Okay, so if we think of how our GPU is uh, built, usually we have a die that's connected to some, you know, DRAM, uh, DDR RAM, all these kind of whatever uh, RAMs. So it's it's connected over a bus. So you have your your chip, and you have on chip memory, which would include say local memory as well as different different caches. Uh, and then off the chip is your global memory in this in this you know RAM. Uh, so any time we want to access any part of global memory, essentially our GPU needs to ask the your RAM, which is off off chip for uh, some sort of a cache line. Um, and then it's slowly passed uh, off this pass from this this um, this this RAM onto your chip. Uh, and the the size of your cache line is hardware dependent, but in general we want to be using all of this cache line, okay? Uh, and it gets kind of bubbled up through cache, and then it's it's uh, passed to an individual um, uh, subgroup, which we'll talk more about in a second. Um, yeah, you want to avoid unnecessary accesses. You want to make sure that you're using all of this. So memory access operation is done in chunks. Uh, yeah, I've said cache lines, but chunks as well. Um, so accessing data that is physically close together is more efficient because we're using all of the chunks rather than using only parts of the chunks. Okay, so if we access data uh, like this, okay, so let's say we're doing, uh, we're accessing just with our global ID, it means that essentially work item zero is accessing data point zero, work, work item one is accessing data point one, and so on. So we're using this entire cache line that's fed up uh, from our from our um, GPU RAM onto your onto your chip. Okay. So bear in mind that when we're programming for CPUs, um, we generally want our uh, work item, say a thread. We want to load a cache line, and then we want to index across that cache line with a single thread. Okay. So when we're programming GPUs. Instead, we want to use uh, our single cache line, uh, and we want it to be shared among work items in a subgroup. We do not want a single work item to be indexing through a cache line. We want a cache line to be handed to a bunch of work items, and then it's all used at exactly the same time. Okay, So the fundamental unit uh, that is loading a cache line from global memory is um, it's, it's in uh, SQL, it's called a subgroup. Uh, and that corresponds to a CUDA warp. Um, can can someone uh, can someone tell us the difference between a, a CUDA warp and a CUDA block, or a, equivalently a SQL subgroup and a SQL work group? Any volunteers? Is this related to some forward progress? Stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I would say that in a subgroup, you 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 can move in a in lockstep, where outside of subgroup, you have no clue if those are are even executing. Is this is this correct? 
yeah exactly yeah thanks thanks to yeah so you can you can think of a subgroup um or a CUDA warp as you can almost think of them as say a single uh execution unit like a single simd unit and it's happening in lockstep um yeah whereas a work group is executing uh, asynchronously so you would have multiple subgroups executing at different times and they might alternate in and out of different different subgroups in order to execute so you want so the the subgroup is the one that's asking for things from from global memory and receiving things so you want all of the work items in your subgroup to be fed in a single say cache line okay uh if you really get into optimizing your code for cache line size you want to be passing exactly one of these cache lines which i think on the a100 i think it's 128 bytes uh no sorry i think it's 256 bytes which corresponds to each work item loading um a uh, an eight byte uh type okay so this is where you're getting maximum usage out of your out of your cache line so if, if we come from from cpu is it's okay to say that a thread uh, a subgroup is just a vector thread right a thread will execute vector instruction and then you you will have multiple thread ex executing vector instruction and you don't know how they will schedule and this one are more groups well, so th this is kind of an implementation detail um it really depends on so usually it's using an open so you presumably you're using an open cl uh, no sorry project. i just have the the abstract memory model how it is implemented it. but it, you have you may think of them as ex executing vector instruction who are executing on lockstep right i mean is your memory model is more a cpu thing yeah yeah so so yeah definitely with the gpu you can you know um conceptualize them as executing in lock, lockstep but quite often cpu implementations will have um will have subgroups executing uh, not in lock, except they'll be sequentialized with a single thread, essentially, um, or using SIMD, SIMD lanes, if possible. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I, I'm not an expert on forward progress guarantees. Uh, I, I need to maybe revisit uh, John's talk, uh, John Pennycook's talk on this. And yeah, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure because in his talk, uh, he differentiated subgroup and workgroup as being so workgroup is weakly parallel um and subgroup was um i can't remember exactly but I, I i don't think there was the guarantee that a subgroup is executing in lockstep i don't think there is that guarantee in sickle but it for for a gpu um backend we can conceptualize it as such yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll need to I'll need to double check the the talk again. Okay, so yeah, we're using all of our memory here. This is great. Okay. Um, by contrast, if we are, let's say, we're indexing into the global ID times two, we have a strided memory access. Then, of this cache line that we're feeding up to our to our subgroup, only half of it is now used. Okay, because the memory controller isn't smart enough to say, aha, we're only using these parts and we're going to squeeze them into some smaller part. No, uh, it's it's not good at doing that. Okay, so we're, we're wasting uh, half of our memory bandwidth. Okay, this is not good. Okay, so coalescing global memory access is, um, yeah, it's particularly important in multiple dimensions. Um, and that's because, yeah, if we have some data, which is, say, uh, two-dimensional data, we need to think about how it is linearized in, in memory, because obviously memory itself is, is linear. There's no such thing as two-dimensional memory, really. Um, and, yeah, the way that we linearize things is row major and column major. I presume that uh, everyone, is, everyone has done this. A lot since they were whatever in, in university or that kind of thing. Okay, so yeah, in CUDA, um, so in CUDA, the iteration space, the execution space is column major. The way that we we get our say linear index is 
um, the thread idx.x, this is our kind of last, our last offset. So we're never multiplying that by some stride. Um, so because the x is the, um, the close together bits, we call it column major. By contrast, in sickle, um, the iteration space, the execution space, is row major, meaning that the, um, the coordinate of a work item in the, the kind of rightmost direction uh, is the ones that are, that are uh, closest together. These are the, the, the so for instance, um, uh, work item 001 is beside work item 002. But in CUDA, work item 100 is beside work item 200. Okay, so that can be a, a that can be a big performance issue when you're porting from CUDA to SQL, because you're used to indexing uh, from the with the X dimension being there your kind of um, your uh, the, the the dimension that is say contiguous when you when you take a single stride. Um, it's it's the other way around in in uh, SQL, and this is because SQL wants to align with C plus plus in general. Um, yeah, obviously in in uh, C plus plus and C, when we have multi dimensional arrays, it's the the dimension on the right which is the the contiguous bits. Okay, um, so in order to calculate your linear ID, we're taking the ID zero. So this is your ID zero. You can conceptualize it as going up times four plus the ID one. Okay, ID one is get the global ID one. Okay. Yeah, so this is good. Okay, we have uh, row major data as well as row major uh, indexing into that data, a row major, say, iteration space. Okay, because our, our data is row major in, in uh, C and C++. Okay, what about if we swap these around? Okay, so if we swap these around so that uh, we conceptualize, so if we were to naively port our CUDA code to SQL, um, and this is our thread ID, uh, IDX dot Y. Okay, so we, if we port this to um, to the the outermost index in SQL, then we would um, potentially be uh, accessing into this data in a in an inefficient way. Okay. Um, yeah. So the problem is we've conceptualized our iteration space as being column major. Um, whereas our data is row major. So we're trying to access row major data with column major iteration space, but the iteration space is, we should conceptualize instead as, as row major. Um, and we'll get this kind of funky access pattern. Um, in general, our memory controller uh, on our GPU will not be smart enough to do this in a single load. Uh, yes, yeah, so we want to help our uh, memory manager as much as possible. Um, by accessing in this sort of way. Okay. Um, yeah. Very briefly, we'll talk about array of uh, arrays of structs versus structs of arrays. Uh, um, yeah. So when we are structuring our our data, it can be convenient to have say arrays of structs. The structs might have a coordinate with a velocity and that kind of thing. Um, but the problem is, if we're only loading say the coordinate. Um, in this array, then we're we're also loading the 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 velocity as well, but we're just not using it. Okay, so we're we're wasting our bandwidth. So instead, we want to have separate arrays, um, separate arrays for velocities and for or positions. Say, so we want to have a single struct or multiple structs of arrays instead of arrays of structs. Okay, so in this case, let's say. Um, yeah, we want to only use the floats. Okay, we're we're accessing the ints. We're we're loading the ints as well. We're just not using them. Okay, so we're wasting bandwidth. Okay, this is not good. Okay, if instead we restructure our data so that we have an array of floats and an array of uh, ints, and this is maybe contained in a single struct, then we can get far better uh, access patterns. Okay, so we can just load this bit in the uh, single cache line. And then when we need the ints, we can load those. Okay, and this gives us better um, memory throughput. 
Okay, so when we coalesce our memories, we can see that we get better performance. Okay, um, so I'm going to jump into this very quickly. Oh, no. Okay, I'm going to jump into the code quickly. Are there any questions on that? Maybe a quick question. Do you think this optimization are already hardware dependent or, or portable or what kind of uh, performance you performance probability yeah. are you losing? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. So um, I, th I think in general, um, when we talk about GPUs, uh, all GPUs that, um, or at least all mainstream GPUs, uh, they perform better when uh, using coalesced global memory accesses. Um, and it's a product of the fact that the individual work items in uh, GPUs, they do not have as much cache as a CPU uh, core or a CPU thread might have. So it cannot physically cache you know, a significant amount of data for that single work item to use. So as soon as it's fed data, it kind of needs to use it. Um, if you have a different, a slightly different architecture that's maybe a hybrid between a GPU and a and a CPU, then you might actually be able to cache um, lots of values at the work item level, and you can index through these at at the work item level. But at the moment, the way that GPUs are are kind of architectured, you don't have this this big uh, per work item cache. You have Big kind of shared caches, and uh, you know, you're, you've, I suppose, yeah, bandwidth is 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 more of a uh, GPUs are are optimized for bandwidth in general rather than than latency. Um, so I think in general, uh, coalesced global memory accesses um, do I think for for GPU code they they do make a big difference, and I don't think it's in a back end dependent way. Maybe Ronan can disagree with me because he. Is, has more um, knowledge of kind of uh, strange kinds of hardwares, um, but yeah, is is that a satisfactory answer? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, um, <clears throat> now, no, this is frozen on me again. So I need to. Um, can you see my my terminal? Yes. Okay, sorry, I keep getting logged out of NERSC. Do 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 do. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, I don't know. So in the previous example, you know, what? I'm just going to go back to the exercise five. Okay, so in the previous example, we did this kind of fishy thing, where we um, we we change our global ID. Okay, we we transpose our global ID. Okay, so this was a little bit fishy. So it means that essentially, work item I is going to be reading data that is not contiguous with work item I plus one. Okay, because we've transposed. Instead, it's going to be uh, reading data which will be uh, contiguous with. Or sorry, sorry. Okay, so let's just say. So uh, I maybe J. just to let you know, you have uh, ten more minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Yeah, before it's free. Okay, uh, I'll go through this. Okay, work on my J wants to access. Um, so 
work out on i j plus one. Okay, so when we flip this, instead, work item ij will be accessing. Um, so, work item. So, this is only because we flip this in this kind of contrived way. Work item ij will access data beside um, the data that. Work item J accesses. Okay, this is not good. Okay, we want to we want to be doing it this way. Okay, so when we comment this out, okay, and we do clean. Oi. Okay, so we can remind ourselves as well um, what the previous performance was. That's the nice thing about using these batch scripts. Okay, so cat slurm. So that was the previous one. Okay. Um, batch.sh. Do, 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 do. Okay. Okay. So, huh? No, what have I done? Is that right? Ah, no space. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Get global ID. Oh, sorry. So sorry. This is a funny thing, isn't it? Um. Why was that happening? Why was that happening? Uh, ah, yeah. Okay, sorry, it should be sick of it. No, so sick of range, global range. Mm. This is classic. Um, why is that happening? Why is that happening? <laughs> That's coalesced. Coalesced, coalesced, coalesced. Um, okay, so we have get global ID. Ah, okay, so that means the way that we index into this must be. Incorrect. Um, see time channels. No, that's okay. So source is global ID plus halo offset. Okay, times channel stride. Yeah, this should be fine. Should be fine. Um, something funny is happening here. Uh, okay, so in the interest of time. I'm going to just go on to the next thing. Okay, so moral of the story, the way we order our indexes can have a big impact on our performance. There's something, there's something, so this should be the faster version, but there's something else in this code um, that is potentially, um, that is potentially making it the opposite way around. No, that's ID one. One so question. Yes. Um, so if you are, let's say, translating or getting a CUDA code into a SQL code or porting mm -hmm. some sort of, so you need to be careful with that global ID because CUDA has another kind of ordering. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And but all these tools that do that kind of job of translating code, is they're aware of that or... The, so the tools actually, they're a little bit uh, lacking in this. Um, as well, like lots of different applications have their own very, very fancy way of, um, of say linearizing their, their, you know, data structures. So the, the, as far as I'm aware, the cyclomatic tool does not try and 
compute these indexes and reverse them just because it's 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 very very error prone error prone um so it's something that the that the the application developer needs to be really aware of okay thank you yeah no problem um just, yeah maybe just i think for historical reason OpenCL was using what seeker is doing right is, is why so I don't know why NVIDIA at some point chosen to, to not follow the same convention as OpenCL, but yeah, it's just you have a painful convention like row measure or column measure. I think none of them are correct per se. It's just yeah, sad that we have two conventions. I don't think it. Or maybe maybe some people have better understanding of if one have some advantage on over the other, but my impression was this was just a convention. Yeah, that's that's certainly my understanding as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's there's something there's something happening here um, that is undoing this undoing, um, and I will I will find out exactly what it is, and I'll um, I'll I'll let people know um, 